Here, children of all ages are taught in the same room. Nearby are these plaster studies inspired by both the beautiful and the horrible. And this was the home of a local physician whose son reached the highest office of the state. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Behind me are the buildings which make up and house the collection of the Kankakee County Historical Museum. It's a collection that reminds people of this area's past and which has ties to two countries. On display are these items, once used by the first people who inhabited the area. They had been attracted by the rich river valleys, as were the Europeans later. These artifacts were discovered at the location of the first permanent settlement, which eventually became Kankakee. It was a trading post that had been established by a French Canadian named Noel Lavasseur. Eventually, his business became a destination point for other of his fellow countrymen who also settled in the area. Here's Noel's account book showing his system for recording his fur tradings with the Potawatomi Indians. Also from Noel's time is this silk gown his wife wore for their wedding in 1838. Here's some jewelry, which she later had made from the hair of their children. Besides highlighting early history, the museum also chronicles some of the businesses once located in the county. During the Victorian era, the scenic river valley, which had first attracted Native Americans and then Noah Lavasseur, began to attract wealthy clientele from South Chicago. One popular destination was the Riverview Hotel. Built in 1887, it offered the finest accommodations found along the Kankakee River. Here's some silverware from the hotel, along with glassware from the bar area. But this wasn't the only draw. In 1883, a local riverboat captain named William Cougar opened his own tourist attraction, a waterfront park. And of course, the best way to travel to Guggen's Grove was on one of his own steamboats. Once there, guests would find a pavilion for dancing to live bands, a clubhouse, and for the younger crowds, a shoot-to-shoot -shoot ride. Here's a ticket from 1892 for a grand excursion to the Grove, costing 75 cents. But boats weren't the only way to travel. At one time, more railroad companies had their hub in Kankakee than any other town in the state. And when the Illinois Central came in, it forced the town to change its axis from running parallel to the river to running parallel with its lines. On display are examples of china patterns that were exclusive to certain lines. This wild rose motif was used by the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. Here's a scale model from 1880 that was used by the construction foreman as a visual aid for the bridge workers. Welcome back to the Kankakee County Historical Museum, whose displays not only recount this area's history, but which includes artifacts from some of the businesses which once called this area home, such as the F.D. Redicky Brewing Company. Here's the mosaic emblem that was in front of the company's offices. One of their products was vitamin beer, an alcoholic drink with a little something extra for the body. And over here is this rare cigar store Indian. Its predecessor, along with the tobacco company building it stood in front of, was lost in 1871 in the Chicago fire. So the owner moved to Kankakee, opened another plant, and ordered another cigar store Indian statue. Due to his Chicago experience, this time he decided to buy a cast metal figure. During restoration, the museum discovered that this is one of only two known figures produced in this style that are still in existence. One wing of the museum holds the plaster studies done by the renowned artist George Gray Barnard. He spent his childhood years in Kankakee and never forgot the town. Two years before he died, he donated all of his plaster models to his old high school. That was in 1938, and they were put on display until more classroom space was needed. After that, the pieces were stored in the basement where several were lost or damaged beyond repair. Today, the surviving pieces have found a permanent home here. One of his most famous and controversial works was this bust of Lincoln, which was commissioned by the Taft family. 
Before he began the work, George spent six months studying the life mask and the photos taken of the late president. Determined to portray Lincoln as a real man of the frontier, the statue's rough-hewn features were termed by some critics as ugly and having been done in poor taste. Today it's considered one of the best representations of Abraham Lincoln. He was living in France when World War I erupted. Afterwards, he created and submitted several designs for monuments to honor the fallen. This is one of them. It was patterned after the stone effigies of medieval knights seen in European churches. It shows a soldier draped in an American flag lying on top of his overcoat and bedroll. His boots are caked with the mud that was so prevalent on the front lines. Unfortunately, this submission, like his others for war memorials, was not accepted. Behind me is a one-room schoolhouse which was relocated to the museum grounds. It was built in 1904, and it was the last school of its type closed in the county in 1954. Grades one through eight were taught together in this room, and the most students ever enrolled here numbered 27 in 1911. On the wall is this teacher's contract from that same year. It offered the stately sum of $45 per school month. But the contract also stipulated that the teacher was responsible for the janitorial work as well as the building maintenance. Plus, in the winter, they were charged with starting the fire in plenty of time to warm the school before the children arrived. Notice that the stovepipe traverses the length of the room to radiate as much heat as possible. As was common in such one-room schools, the desks are in graduated sizes to accommodate the smallest first grader and the largest eighth grader, and each had its own inkwell. Next to the museum's main building and the schoolhouse is this home. Construction on it began before the Civil War, and the home was added onto as the family grew. Home to a local doctor, it was saved because of one of his children. Originally, the exterior walls were limestone, like those of the milk house or root cellars, which stands in the back. But in 1890, to create a more formal appearance, Dr. Small had this concrete stucco put on and scored. Originally, the home had four rooms, two above and two below. But eventually, the family would have six children, so the doctor kept adding to the front of the house. This was the first sitting room which became a dining room. Notice the built-in shelves surrounding the room. Very handy in a home with almost no closet space. And this is the new sitting room added in 1870. In a corner is this unique music box which plays metal cylinders, several of which are stored underneath. This was a gathering spot for the family during the evening hours. But for a time, it served a dual purpose because it was the artist studio for Susan Small, the second oldest child, who was also an accomplished artist. Here's a self-portrait she drew at the age of 15. Later, Susan was sent to Europe to study art, and it was there that she became influenced by Monet, as evidenced by her landscapes. But she's not the reason the house has been preserved. Right now, we're in the home of Dr. Abraham Small, who continued his practice here after he closed his downtown office. This parlor, which has its own outside door, became a waiting room during the day. On the other side is the doctor's office and examination room. But today the home is known more for one of his sons than for Dr. Small. This was the birthplace of Lennington Small, who ran for governor a record setting six times. In 1921, he was elected Illinois' 26th governor, and he served for two consecutive terms. But most importantly, he's known for his hard roads. On display is the desk he used while in office. Lynn Small became known as the Good Roads Governor. During his administration, more roads were paved in Illinois than in any other state in the Union, about 7,000 miles in eight years. In addition to the roads and the practice of law, the Small family name was well known in the rhubarb world. 
Dr. Small was an amateur horticulturalist, and he developed methods for growing that plant during winter months. Today, the nursery that once surrounded the home has become a city park, and the home itself is now part of a museum complex that reminds visitors of the rich history of this area. For more information or directions to the Kankakee County Historical Society and Museum, call 815-932-5279.